QR code podcast with your host, Chris Glandon, serving cybersecurity straight up with no chaser. Let's hit the bar and grab a drink. Chris, yo, what's up, brother? Hey, Tony. Just another day, dude. No anomalous behavior detected. Hey, hold up one second. I got to respond back to this text real fast. Up yours and send. Okay, so what can I get you? Dude, what? <sighs> you cracked me up, dude. Ah, uh, that was my buddy. Since I got the Tony vanity plate on my Ferrari, he knows every time I speed by him on the highway. He's just giving me a bunch of shit. Well, I mean, you put it out there. You got to be the only Tony with a Tony vanity plate driving a Ferrari. I mean, it's not like you're hard to miss. That's what happens when you put your info out there on blast. Yeah, well, normally I fly by him way too fast for anyone to see and read it anyway. Well, that's another problem in itself. Let's just say they know who you are. So what, am I famous? I wouldn't say that, but I see a guy that just stopped by that can definitely school you on the data security and privacy topic. And after that long haul from Chicago, I'm sure he's going to settle in for a minute. I think I'll go holler at him real quick. Oh, he's from Chicago? Well, hell, I got the perfect drink for you then. It's a barcode hidden gem, the Chicago Apple Cider. Have you ever heard of those? Nah, man, but it sounds good. Give me the data on that one. Well, here it is. First, you're going to pour one ounce Canadian Mist whiskey, quarter ounce of gold schlagers, all that into an old-fashioned glass filled with ice. Stir it, and then top it off with some apple juice. Boom. There you go. That's legit. Definitely a sleeper drink. Speaking of sleep, I gotta go catch some Z's, dude. I got booze by coming in around nine to take over. Okay, man. Well, I'm gonna go ingest this drink. I'll catch you soon. <laughs> Copy that. I'll see y'all next round. Adi Elliott brings more than a decade of leadership experience in the software and services industry to his role leading Canopy's global revenue operations. He has extensive experience building and leading high-performance marketing, sales, product, and strategy teams. He's led multiple marketing, sales, and product teams recognized for innovation and has deep experience in business operation, strategic planning, and corporate development. In his free time, Adi enjoys hiking with his wife in the Pacific Northwest, playing basketball, and cheering for the Portland Trailblazers. And thanks to his three sons, he somehow became pretty serious about playing Pokemon Go. So Adi, what's up, man? Welcome to Barcode. What's happening? Thanks for having me. Anytime, man. It's been a long time coming. Indeed. So um, did Pokemon lead you here or did you make the trek on your own? Made the trek on my own, although now Pokemon Go is like, I would almost call it the background radiation of my life and that <laughs> it just kind of happens. And uh, yeah, I can't even tell if I enjoy it or not at this point, but it, but it is a thing that I do. Nice. And you're in Chicago? I am. Yeah. Awesome. So home of the famous Data Diva. Home of the famous Data Diva. Exactly. Which is kind of how we met. Shout out Debbie Reynolds. Shout out Debbie Reynolds and, and shout out Jeff Jokish as well. Uh, who actually introduced the two of us on LinkedIn. So yeah, if you're not connected to those two, um, log on to LinkedIn, find them. They really, really uh, put up some awesome content online. So yeah, I mentioned Canopy, uh, which I do want to hit on, but if you don't mind talking to me a little bit about your experience and what led you up to this point. Yeah, sure. It was like many circuitous, but Uh, It was through an adjacency uh, from eDiscovery. So back in, uh, back in 08, I was in Chicago and, and trying to figure out how to not move to essentially either Silicon Valley or the Seattle area. Now, what I know now, I was from Chicago. So what I know now, I would have been like, oh man, Seattle's awesome. I should a hundred percent go there. And, and Redmond is fantastic. And I should have embraced that. But at the time, and it, things worked out like from a, from a pure uh, uh, business standpoint. But at the time, I wanted to stay in Chicago. I'm a Chicago person. And there was this uh, small consulting company that wanted to become a software company. And, and they needed somebody to lead marketing to help do that. So I was like, all right, I'll do that. It was like a 15, 20 person company, something like that. It was a tiny company. They had no marketing. So I, I was like, all right, I'll lead marketing at this company. And they were an e-discovery company. 
And they were called, uh, at the time, Kikira. Now they're called Relativity. And, and at last valuation, they, uh, uh, I think uh, within the last year or so, they had a valuation of like $3.6 billion. So that was an amazing journey. I was there for uh, six years from like 08 until however, uh, whatever the math of six years works out to. But uh, essentially, like e-discovery is this adjacency to security and that it's this like data, data wrangling mm. space in which like you, you have this like business reason to have to sort through data and give it to somebody else. And then that's how me and Debbie uh, uh, met as well is that she, she had a tangential uh, or she was like very deeply uh, involved in, in e-discovery as well. And it's interesting in that it's like this data problem it's not at all interesting and that it's just essentially helping companies sue each other. So in that sense, it's not like rewarding for your soul in any, in any regard, but it is interesting in that it's getting your arms around data. So working at, at Relativity, and then I, I left Relativity to, to go to one of their clients, and then we sold that business. And then I was at Relativity's biggest client. And then we had like, a, that was a public company and we took that private. And that was incredibly interesting business stuff. But that was all kind of, I would say, like a decade long journey in different aspects of this e-discovery data wrangling space. And at that point, it was, uh, I knew whatever I did next, I definitely did not want it to be e-discovery. Really? And yeah, I, I was just kind of... Tired of it by that point? Tired of it. And, and it kind of got back to, I just like, it was interesting but I would say it's a commodity space. Like it's a space in which like you kind of, there's not really much to, to, to do different in the big scheme of things. It's just all about consolidation and, and bigger and bigger companies. And the, the, the tech is kind of the tech. So there's not a, like, it's, it's kind of just an, a known, a known space, a known quantity. And again, like, like the soul, like if you, if you care about it and, for me, I do. I do want to know that what I'm doing is a part of like healing the world or whatever, or making the world at least a better place. And like, I don't know, helping companies, helping big companies to each other. While I agree that the legal system needs to needs to exist and there needs to be an avenue for that, it just uh, whatever. It was like milk toast to me as a as a as a vertical to be in, as a space to be in. So interestingly, a buddy of mine was he's like he he runs the the. Uh, the leading or one of the leading probably like uh, uh, staffing companies in the space uh, of privacy. And he said, Hey man, there's this like privacy security company. And they're, they remind me a little bit about, about what relativity was when you joined them. They're talking about uh, they, they similar like executive leadership, like they're, they're pure play software. They weren't ever a consulting company or anything, but they're taking the next leap. And, and that was Canopy. Canopy was like the leading data breach response software. And that's kind of how it got in. And this, this uh, True Staffing is the name of that company. They're like a leading uh, for privacy folks. They place a ton of like chief privacy officers and stuff like that. So they're like, like deeply involved in that space. And that's how he just made the connection. And I've known their CEO for a lot of years because he's just a cool business person. And he just hooked me up with the CEO of Canopy and just said, hey, you guys should meet. And which I guess is like the sign of a, of a great staffing, a, a great CEO of a staffing company is just setting people up like that. And, uh, and that's how I got into the space. Like data breach response was an incredibly interesting space. It's brand new in the big scheme of things, right? Where like the, the, the regulatory climate kind of came out of nowhere that all of a sudden, because if you think like a decade back, uh, no one, this wasn't, the, the regulatory climate was, was not, we should protect people's uh, uh, PII or personal information just generally. And now it is, and that's very sensible. But the like, how you go about that, uh, the devil's in the details there. And there was no real tech for it. And Canopy was the first company to really be pure play on the software side for it. And I just found what they were doing incredibly interesting, all the AI in it incredibly interesting, and the bigger privacy and security space that it exists in. The whole thing just seemed uh, incredibly interesting. So that's kind of how I got here. I, I love the intersection of like business and the law and and technology, software, uh, and, and kind of helping people and helping the world. That's an awesome story. And I just want to break that down a minute. Um, when you say data breach response, are you referring to the IR process? So kind of, yes. I mean, I mean, I am. Ex and if you look at like the, like the NIST uh, uh, look at the NIST uh, uh, diagram or, or go to the big page for IR, you'll see there's like one little line that then says like data breach response. 
and and there's not much expounding on it. But in like your business, your your average business email compromise or ransomware, which is really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like data business email compromise and ransomware is 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 the, the kind of daily machinations of data breach response. Right. There's nothing that breaks that down, even though it's one of the single most expensive and hard to execute parts of this. Because if you if you think of the regulations, the regulations say, and I, I'm speaking very loosely, right? But the regulations say you need to notify the people who are who are impacted uh, by by a compromise event. And one of the things that's interesting is like the UK and the EU take this one way, Australia takes it another way, Canada takes it another way, different states in the US. But yeah, we're talking about the space of figuring out who was impacted. Uh, uh, by a compromise event, whether or not anybody was and whether it's a breach legally, and then getting them notifications. That's, that's and, and in the IR space, it's an incredibly impart, important part of the reactive IR space, but it's also widely misunderstood or just unknown completely because it just exists as this like one line with very little explanation. Gotcha. Okay, so you're actually helping deliver that message to the person who was breached or, or to that organization that was breached. So we're like the software layer of it. So like here, here's the here's the big breakdown of of where we enter, where we come into it. So say uh, in the IR process, they detected an intrusion and then they confirmed. Let's 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 keep it real simple and say it was a it was a phishing attack. Somebody clicked on a link in an email and they confirmed yes, this person's PST was compromised. So now that that triggers the offshoot into our world. Now we work with the people who use our software, like uh, digital forensic incident response folks. They're usually the first on the scene or the first in with our software. We work with law firms who are usually managing the overall process. We work with review service providers who, when the data needs to be looked at, and and I'll get into that a little bit. They like they they know they have a rolodex of people of okay, we got thirty people who can look through this hundred thousand documents or whatever it is. But here's kind of how this unfolds: that PST gets uploaded into our software. And, and again, remember a lot of times in the, in the EU, they say in GDPR, they say you got 72 hours to at least let like the regulatory body know high level what's happened here. What, what are the, what is the impact in the U S it varies by, by state, Virginia, California, Colorado, it's all over the place. And you kind of got to navigate all of that. And that's what also the, all the awesome law firms in the space are for, but the, the, the PST gets uploaded into our software. We throw a battery of AI at the software or at the, at the data. Mm. And essentially, all that AI is doing is is looking at what is the PII and how many people are in this data. Because at first, you just have to do, you have to figure out what do we even have here. Is this is this a nothing burger, or is this or, or is this probably a breach? And we need to get, plan on the review. So that's step you upload the soft, uh, upload the PST. So a person basically looks at it in our software then and says, "Okay, uh, we unloaded it." The PST, like, uh, it turns out it's like, and I'll just keep the numbers easy, a million records, which is not crazy for a PST. A PST can have a million records in it, no problem. Sure. So, so then they say, okay, out of that million, 150,000, according to Canopy's data breach product, uh, 150,000 have PII or a, or a human being listed in them. So, okay, so that 150,000, that's the part we need to look at. And then a human being or a group of human beings then take that 150,000 and say, okay, Allison McDaniel, that's her, that's her name, that's her social security number, and that's her address, link it all together onto the next document. Up, oh, that's uh, Allison, but this time it's Allison Smith. Uh, maybe she got married, maybe she didn't, I don't know, different last name, but that's still her social security number and different address. Well, that makes sense if she got married because she may be moved, like they may be moved into a shared place, who knows? On to the next document. Allison McDaniel again, now we've got her passport number and so on and so forth, right? So our software facilitates that review of just linking the human beings to the, to the compromised uh, elements of the, of the data. And then finally, if you think about it towards the end, now we've got like, we might have had Allison's data on, on 20 different documents and we've got three different addresses. We've got a passport number, we've got a social security number, we've got a credit card, and we've got multiple names. And maybe some, sometimes there was her middle name, sometimes not middle name, sometimes McDaniel, sometimes Smith, whatever. Uh, the name's made up. So sorry if there's Allison Smiths and McDaniels out there. Like, what are you talking about? We're not referring to you. <laughs> yep. Not, not you specifically, the general Allison McDaniel, Allison Smith. So, uh, although it would be hilarious if there was an Allison Smith that got married and whatever. <laughs> and I like, I am Allison McDaniel, but so then, yeah, you have to consolidate that entity. Like, cause all the lawyers want to know is like, all right, Smith, McDaniel, addresses. 
who, where are we sending the letter? Like, that's all they are like, who, who are we sending it to? And what's the address? And then what comes out of our system in a way, what comes into our system is a bag of data, like the PSTs or like the file share or compromise data. And what comes out is like a list of names and addresses. And there's a lot of work in the middle, but that's like incredibly interesting. And there's just a ton of AI happening in that process. And then it goes to like a notification vendor after us. Okay. So, but it's super interesting. And, and by the way, that's an interesting space too, because the notification space is like dominated by all the people that did class action notification. Because if you think about it, the like, I don't know about you, but I got like class action notification of like, oh, uh, Apple's iBook store, something, something, you get a buck 50 to spend for another book or whatever. And then you just get that thing in the mail. The exact same notification, the exact same machinations are to notify you that like one or more of these elements of your data was compromised. And here's what we have for you. Now. Same, same process. They have a list of names, got to send them this letter. Yeah. So when you think about it, they are fortunate to get notified because you have that situation you know, where you find out you've been breached without any notification. So yeah, and that, that was, what's interesting about the space is because it's so new, uh, there wasn't like this long history of software companies slowly but surely solving the problem, right? Like if you think about a lot of other spaces, like, like even just take like your HR database system or whatever, like HR databases have been around forever. I mean, heck, there was the concept of HR in the, like the 60s and 70s and then it got computerized and then it got like more and more and more. Slowly but surely, they get made them be better and better and better by technology. And so, and it's customized like HRIS systems and I'm just using that as an example, but any space that's been around a long time is the same. They, they've, they, there's all this uh, slowly but surely expectation and software custom made for it and innovation happening. But, uh, the notification uh, then the regulations around personal information and notifying people, that's like brand new. So there was like no software for it when GDPR hit and CCPA started uh, is strongly enforced and all of these states care and Australia. And I, it's, it's extremely sensible regulations, but it wasn't like there was a bunch of software just sitting there that had been like keeping up with this space for the last like several decades. At first, all people had to do or all they were doing, all they could do was use the best available software, which frankly wasn't very good. But it was like, if you think about it for the, for the like, what do we have here? They would try and search it and use regular expressions mm -hmm. because the search technology, like it's like, that's what we got. We don't have AI yet. We just have, because we have the space has been around that long. So they would like search it and use regular expressions. And then out of that same million, it would say like, if you just search data and use regular expressions, it's going to tell you like 700,000, 650,000, a huge percentage like might hit. And then you, what you end up saying is, okay, either one, we're going to look at, at that 700,000 or two, we're just going to look at everything because in that 700,000, it's like Heisenberg's nightmare because you're kind of like over-inclusive and under-inclusive simultaneously. So it's like the worst of all worlds. So either they were reviewing everything or, or they were just missing stuff and some people weren't getting notified. So, yeah. and everyone's just trying their best, but I don't begrudge people because that's all they had, but it was, it was a mess. And often people won't get notified of breaches involving more uncommon data sets. So what I mean is like you hear about sensitive data and your mind immediately pivots to PII, PHI, credit card, IP, et cetera, et cetera. But typically we don't consider data being more unorthodox, like tribal knowledge, um, phone conversations, displaying emotions, emotional behavior. So I'm just curious, have you ever approached it from that angle? We do insofar as the, the regulations really dictate what, what our AI is looking at. So like if you look at like GDPR is interesting in a way because their interpretation is much grayer than than typical like HIPAA and CCPA and all the US stuff. The US stuff is pretty black and white, like social security number, credit card. It's pretty prescriptive. Here's exactly what you're looking for. But in GDPR and and you're more likely to see stuff like religious affiliation and and or or just aspects of people's life that even two regular people can look at and be like, I don't know, was that revealed there? I'm not sure. I, I kind of can infer some stuff, but I'm not totally sure. So in that sense, sometimes 
insofar as it's for us, it's really the regulations. The 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 if if it's uh if it's a US breach and there's people in this, and by the way, it's where people live that kind of dictates it. That's what's interesting. So even though the company might be based in in Florida, if there's a set number of people that are in that are that whose addresses are that they live in California, then it's CCPA that's governing those people. So that's another interesting aspect of it is that it's not even really where the breach occurred. It's where the citizens of the people whose data was impacted are. Yeah, with so many privacy regulations, it's hard for me to keep up. And a lot of that time, you know, you're up against the clock in terms of disclosure. 100%. Hundred percent. Like the the clock is ticking, and there's nobody to negotiate with. The regulations say, "Here's how long you've got." Period. End of story. There's not like some opposing party that you can be like, "Well, I need an extension." No, it's like <laughs> right. go, go, go. Like you have to like do this. And again, like, and this is one of those places where I actually think to to in the in the big scheme of things, I think the politicians and the regulatory bodies got this one right. In that, for a lot of this stuff. It actually wasn't totally possible to comply initially, but it set the North Star. Like 72 hours on notifying the ICO in like England, for instance, was like an easy North Star for us of how good do we have to be at, at, at detecting that initial PII and reporting. All right, like we got to be able to do it and we got to be comfortably able to hit 72 hours because it's not just the results in 72 hours. It's like, Look at it, get your arms around it, think about it, have a conversation with attorneys, get the attorneys together so they know what do we really need to report. So you need a lot of buffer around 72 hours, for instance. And the, the, it was great that the regulatory bodies, because ultimately they're all looking out for us as individuals. They, they set the North Star on this stuff of like essentially saying what companies like ours have to hit. Like here's, here's where you need to get to. Hmm. I want to go back to AI for a second. Sure. I'm just curious on your stance in general uh, with AI and data protection. You know, we hear these nightmare stories of AI, yep, including the bad data that's funneled into AI systems. In your perspective, how much can we rely on AI systems now? And do you believe that there is an optimal way to train AI with good data to be more accurate? So. Uh, yeah, I, I can get I can get kind of takey here, and we can even talk about non our world examples. But I, I I'd essentially say this: the tighter of a box you can put AI in, the better. And AI is in like for for a tightly defined problem, AI can be a godsend. And and what I mean by that is like in and within our software, uh, each model essentially does one very narrow thing. For instance, there's like a model that does nothing but detect names. And even that model, there's, it depends on the language. So there's different models for different languages. But because the machinations of it work a little differently. But when that, that model's only job is to surface a name, that, that, then that's a tightly defined problem that the AI can solve really well. But, if you tr- but this idea, as soon as you like want to branch out to, uh, I'll, I'll guess I could use another example. Self-driving cars, very ill-defined problem, very difficult problem to solve. I'm like, I, it seems like that problem has been three years out for the last like decade. I'm very skeptical that in three years we're going to have like self-driving cars without people. Now, because I'll say this, even in our software, you're never relying fully on the AI. There are people that are validating. And that's part of how our software has gotten so good is that you, because there has to be a human validation and review, we queue it up. We say, all right, Allison McDaniel and social security number and address. But then a person actually like validates that and says, yes, boom, 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 done. But if it said, uh, I don't know, if it was the name Christian instead of the religious affiliation Christian and from context, it like got it wrong one way or the other, that's great because then we get that feedback. Oh, no, this is a refi- religious affiliation Christian, not name Christian. And then that updates the software and so on and so forth. So for us, it's, I guess, similar to self-driving cars and that if you think about it, like we're all, I guess, teaching Waymo how to drive by all those CAPTCHAs where it's like, what is a crosswalk? And then we're all picking crosswalks so Waymo can have a self-driving car program. So I guess if the only thing the car had to do, if literally its only task was like pick out crosswalks, then, then self-driving cars would probably be done by now. 
unfortunately, the self-driving car problem is well beyond crosswalks. But for us, the models are pretty tightly defined. It's just do this one little thing, but there's like hundreds of models. So we have just tons of models that are doing different stuff. Got it. Got it. So my name is Christian, by the way. So it's funny that you said- Oh, I didn't. I've always just known you as Chris. So that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Some, some PII for the listeners out there. Um, yeah. It makes sense to me that you have multiple data ingestion areas for AI, but each one narrowly scoped. And uh, that's what I'm envisioning. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I, I've become, I guess this being a part of a company that f- the uses AI in very fundamental ways to do what it does. It has made me more skeptical of the generalized AI that's going to like take a, take over everything. And eventually we're going to be like the little puppy dogs to the AI running the show. It's made me a little bit more skeptical to that idea like that a hundred percent. Cause I'm not an absolutist on, uh, on that sort of thing, but it, it's made me less inclined to, to, to worry about that scenario. But I do think in the, for for all the sorts of problems that that we're solving, uh, AI is incredibly beneficial. And I would say the other the 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 bear case for is really in just like what kind of problem people are trying to solve with it. And so I would say the other side to that to get at like kind of the horror stories, I would say the two horror stories to me break down into two buckets. Either one people saying, oh, we have AI, our software is awesome. And then really it's just a hamster on a wheel behind the scenes and there's no real AI happening. And you're just like, that's just people. You're just throwing people at it. That's a mechanical Turk. That's not AI at all. <laughs> right. So like that's, uh, yeah, not, not necessarily the Theranos story, but like in the realm of it, of just like, nah, that's not, that just doesn't do what it say, what you're saying it does. And then the other side is badly scoped AI where people are trying to solve a problem that is just way too big for AI uh, from a, from a problem standpoint. And then it goes off into crazy directions. So. Yeah, it's a very good point. And it's almost like you have to understand what AI is because if not, you can be easily fooled by just people selling it. I mean, unfortunately people are selling that term alone. That's essentially what they're doing. Yeah, it's a buzz term and it's like, like the, the more you truly get involved with it, the more you see, oh, narrowly, narrowly defined, this is incredibly useful. But in the big scheme of things, like it's also uh, immature is the wrong word, but like it's less threatening and less of a, of a I mean, I think it's going to help humanity and people and business. And I, th- I think it's going to be way more impactful than it already is. But it's going to be way more impactful in the way that software is already impactful in the way that it's just going to speed things up and make jobs simpler and like allow us to like sort through things faster. Do you see a governing body over AI anytime soon? I guess the, the closest I would see to that is probably my guess would be it would work more like the privacy world and that there's different like uh, a, a whole bunch of fractured governing bodies if it so happens. So like China would have its take at it, the the states in the U.S. Because right now things tend to be happening faster on the state level than on the national level for this sort of thing. The uh, Canada would have its take. So I could see a whole bunch of fractured use, but uh, I, I'm not there yet. Yeah, and and not only that, like I think when you get down to it, it's it's still just like what are you trying to do, and the governance is just around like what are people, what problems are actually people trying to solve. Okay, yeah, so it's not so much governing that technology it's governing the outcome of that technology yep cool and i want to deviate just a little bit from the conversation but you mentioned self-driving cars and uh i'm thinking of connected cars and the data that is pulled from users in connected cars is there any regulation around that or do you happen to know how that data is stored and transferred within connected cars I don't offhand know exactly the the regulatory frameworks around that, but I will say it's not much different data than our phones are already doing all the time anyway. True. Like in the big scheme of things, if you like both Android and iPhones are just tracking everywhere we go all the time. Now, again, they're doing it to help us out. Like they're doing it to try and like, like tell us, oh, when you go here, you like this map or when I get in the car, it wants to tell me that you're, I'm going to go to this coffee shop that I like. So it's doing it for reasons to just try and be, try and sell me more stuff and try and help my life. But 
yeah, I, I, at the, at the, at the end of the day, my phone is tracking everything I do also. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you know, data collection is happening, but I just feel like that it's challenging for the average driver to easily know what data is being captured, where it's going and how it's being used. Yeah. And especially this is like a, a whole world of gray, but I I'll, I'll also like my involvement in the space of like privacy and personal information. It's made me in some ways a little Again, it's like reduced my concern about about those problems. Now, again, I will say it's all trade-offs, right? So like no doubt that we are being tracked by all sorts of stuff. Like even just as I talk to you right now, my phone's tracking my GPS, my watch is tracking my vitals, my it, uh, many things are listening for me to say like hey dingus to like for so it can like listen and so then I get, like I won't say the words to trigger it, but you know, you know, they're all listening for that. So like there's all this stuff, but ultimately it's all just trying to help me out. And the other thing that I'll say is a lot of this data is unintelligible to any, anything but machines. Right. Like, and that's where like, I'm, that's where like in the big scheme of things, I like, again, this is just my personal opinion as a person who works in the privacy and and data security and data breach response space and incident response space. I'm, I'm not at all worried about Facebook just trying to serve up better Instagram ads to me. Like, frankly, I kind of like it. I like that my Instagram ads are pretty spot on. They're tailored to me. They're servicing. There's some small business on the other side of that that they would never in a million years be able to reach me without that. But there's like no person inside of Facebook who can like figure out. There's no me for them to figure. Only a machine could make uh, make sense of that to serve me that ad. No, no human can make any sense of it. So in that sense, I just don't worry about this stuff anywhere near as much because it's kind of only machines that it's intelligible to for the most part. I'm so glad that you shared that perspective and the fact that it's coming from someone that is ingrained in the privacy space. You make a very valid point. The tech is there to offer convenience and just be aware, be aware of your surroundings and and be aware that data collection exists. Yeah. And, and I, like I said, it's, it's not nothing. I'm going to like, I'm not saying, Hey, this is no big deal and it's not a thing, but it's a trade-off like the trade-off for like being able to see pictures of, of all my friends stuff and their kids and what they're doing. And like, frankly, get served ads of stuff that I wouldn't know about otherwise, because they have to pay the, like, there's still servers that fail. Like Facebook has to pay all those developers and they have to like, there has to be a business model behind it. And their business model is letting people who want to sell me stuff find me. So I'm like, that all makes sense. Like I can, I, I, that's a reasonable trade off for this free software. Yeah. I can live with that. And like, there's not a, like, so I don't know. That's just me. So with that being said, understanding that there is a line where you could potentially overshare information, right? Yep. Do you have any privacy best practices or any privacy related technology tools that you could share uh, for folks to utilize? I guess like for, for human beings, it's almost like I kind of try and be aware of like, put like what, what phishing is trying to do. Don't post your stuff to, to the companies that, that aren't the big companies that you don't trust. But I, I, I but I kind of flip it in general. And other than you know, if someone's calling you, telling you about a warranty or that you won some money, that that there's no, that's a scam, and that always has been a scam from time immemorial. Like that's just a new version, an updated version of trying to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. And I get <laughs> right. that some people are going to go for it, and I'm sorry that that happens. But the and phishing attacks are are better and better. But I really truly think it's really on businesses to solve these problems. Like, and what I mean by that is it's on not like. Yes, the 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 big like Meta and uh, formerly known as Facebook, I guess, and and Apple and Google and Microsoft and all of those companies like Netflix, like oh, uh, protect my viewing habits. I uh, don't want anybody to know that I like that documentary. I guess, uh, but it's uh, it's on those companies to make make this happen, and and. In the big scheme of things, like the obvious thing that they protect is like the database is full of like, like Facebook, the crown jewels is like what everybody does. They're they're That's like Fort Knox to them. Yeah. Like they a hundred, like not, not like, but they have a self-interest in that too. Like one, 
like it's literally like the biggest reputational harm is is when, if they have compromises to that. So they're going to put in, I'm sure, billions of dollars to protect that data. But also, that's the thing that makes them valuable is that data, and they don't want it out for the like. So so their interests and our interests align in protecting that personal data. They don't want anybody else to have it. So so in that sense, like cool. But I would more say the risks are. And again, I'm, I'm full transparency. I'm biased by the space that I work in and what I see. So I live in the data breach response world. So I see how people's PII gets out there all the time. And the, the aside from like the big databases that you read about in the Wall Street Journal sometimes, like largely it's like phishing attacks. And then the reason it's a compromise is because of the unstructured data that people are putting on file shares and and in email and just not thinking about. That is like from what I see day to day and like seeing kind of having a purview of of like global data breach response like space. It's a lot of just people putting stuff at spreadsheets and emails that have like a long list of credit card numbers because they're just trying to solve their problem in their job or a file share that HR forgets about that has a whole bunch of data in it that just doesn't need to be there. And well, like, I mean, that, that's why for us, the data breach response space has given us an insight of, well, how can we help corporations further upstream? Because like, yes, we're a business that wants to make money, but we really do like want to make the world a better place and help out any way we can with this problem. So that's part of what we're, we're like, like our, it's no accident that our, uh, after data breach response, our second product was like a privacy focused proactive thing that, that got at what is the biggest way that we're seeing data breaches happen and how can we prevent that? And it's really just inside of corporations, people using data and forgetting that it's PII because they have a problem to solve. Because you're not thinking about when HR takes some spreadsheet from this database over here and emails it to their colleague over here and then that person drops it on a file share, they're doing it for some business reason and, they're, and, and that they need, to, they need to solve that problem, but they're not thinking about, uh-oh, like if someone clicks a phishing link, then there's like three different vectors I've just created here. Yeah, it's unintentional data loss, right? They're, they're performing their job function as it's required, yet it's circumventing controls in place to help make their job easier, for instance, and, and just not thinking about it from a security or a data breach perspective. Yeah, and so for, from, from my perspective, it's, it's, it's too much to ask like me, like us as individuals, like not as business people, but like, it's too much to ask like me as an individual to have to think all that much about like protecting my data all the time. Like I, I, that's akin to kind of like, like I would almost say like, how should I protect my credit card number? I don't know. Keep it in my wallet. Like, like, like uh, aside from it being, uh, uh, in databases somewhere and the, the fact that I use it to pay for things. Yeah, you almost expect it to be done for you, right? Like you expect your investment to provide you that protection. Yeah, exactly. And that's a reasonable, to me, that's a reasonable expectation. So I would argue that, that businesses, the gap that we, like that I see in businesses is that there's two things they're doing, but it leaves a big gap. Like, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying dramatically, but here's what we see in the privacy space. On one hand, they're sending out like surveys to people and they're saying, and they're asking them like they're just disclosed data of like, Hey, what do you do with PII? And they tell them, and then they have surveys that they send them where they click through and say, yes, this is what I'm doing. And then they have trainings that say, don't use data this way. And they click through and they validate, yes, I've taken this training. And then the other thing that they're doing is having these like very heavy endpoints everywhere. Let's supposedly look for PII in the enterprise but I would argue, as someone who comes from the world where we really do have to find PII and we, and, and we need to be pretty accurate about it, that's a fool's errand. You're not going to find every piece of PII in the enterprise. And what ends up happening is you just end up overwhelming some security analyst somewhere with a list that's, inco- like, that's just incomprehensibly big, and the, which means it's ineffective. So it becomes check the box. So great, you've deployed some software everywhere that tells you to look everywhere. But like, what does that mean? So the gap was that like, from my perspective is what is the average, not every single one, let's not look at every HR person, but let's like look at one, maybe two, and just like look at if there was a 
compromise event today, what would be in their email or what would be on that file share over there? Let's just look. And that way we know what they tell us and we know what the surveys say, but what I don't know is what's really in their PST. And I know if someone clicks a phishing link, we're going to find out because it's going to go into Canopy and then Canopy is going to say, whoop, they were well, well, they were way out of compliance with what they were saying in those surveys, not because they were acting maliciously, just because they were trying to solve a problem. So let's solve that up front. Let's find out what's really in the PST and then let's ha- like let's benchmark that and let's have a conversation with like line of business leaders and HR prof- and I'm just picking on HR but if finance HR and finance are like the two like places where things often start because they're the two places that have just a ton of PII so that it's it's easy to 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 start there but yeah let's like instead of having a bland training based on what we think they're doing let's have a specific training based on what they're actually doing that we can validate that we can drop a report in the middle of the table and say hey, we looked at two people's data. Here's what was in it. We know you have a problem to solve. How can we solve this? Is it different retention policies? Whatever. And the reason I say that's a huge gap. People don't actually know security and privacy professionals. They know what people tell them they're doing with data, but they don't actually know what they're doing tangibly. Yeah, that's a great point because a lot of times you see that policy pack checkmarked in a tool. And that means in their eyes, okay, we're good. Um, but they aren't actually looking at the workflows and working with the stakeholders who handle that sensitive data on a regular basis. Absolutely. At the end of the day, if you really want to make a compromise not turn into a breach, you really need to focus on like processes and human behavior. Like that's, that's, the, that's, that's what we're trying to solve for on the proactive side. Because like no technology as far as I could tell, is, uh, is, is going to outsmart somebody just clicking on a phishing link or these, these events happening. Like, I don't think you're going to, like, uh, all, all the data says you're not stopping this, at least no, no time that I see in the, in the near future. You should try, but yeah. Definitely should try. Um, but, you know, I think it goes back to just human instinct. And, and I, here's my, ra- like, and I think people are, are like, uh, one, I'm an optimist. So I think people are generally good and not acting maliciously. Yes. I think it's just purely because people are, have a job to, to do and they're not going to keep in their head at all times the privacy and security implications of just doing their job. Because that's, because it could, because there's any number of other things that they need to keep in their head all the time too. And really, they're just going to try and accomplish their job. And that's why you have to actually, you can't, you can't just ask them. You have to look. You have to validate. You have to believe they're going to tell you to the best of their knowledge, but they're going to forget like tons of stuff that's actually happening. Or you're not going to ask everybody and some people are going to forget. And that's, that's still enough. Right. The only way you're really going to know is if you look. Right. So I know we're running up on time and, uh, and my bartender, Tony, keeps pointing at his watch. But uh, my, uh, my concern has always been the out of band methods that can lead to data loss. So uh, for instance, your phone camera, uh, pen and paper, memorization, you can memorize a credit card number and there's no protocol, you know, that you can enter into a tool to prevent that. So that gap represents a risk percentage and, and what is an acceptable percentage there? Like if you're covering 90% of data exfiltration, is that acceptable? Does that vary per industry or per data type? And, um, and is there a way to determine what that acceptable risk is? I'd say probably, but I would flip it a little bit and say worrying about that before, like the, the overwhelming majority of compromise events are not that. And to me, it's almost like the, I would even call it the 80, 20. I'd call it like the 90, 10 or 95, five is like, Let's tackle the things that, that are the like major, the vast majority of these events. Now, again, it's a little different now, like everything I say, like I'm someone who sounds like, uh, a hundred percent certain about everything, but in reality, there's like nuance, but I'm oversimplifying everything I'm saying. And there's tons of nuance. So like part of the nuance is like, obviously if you have like a crown jewel sort of data that literally a, a small number of people are can even access to begin with and that if it, even a picture of this would be like holy cow and that there's like bigger implications and obviously that's a different that's a different bucket but i'm just talking like most compromise events that trigger this entire process most of them are not an internal malicious actor try like taking pictures or 
it's it's literally just some person just trying to do their job and the the situation is it, the 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 fuse was i don't want to say lit or whatever but the like circumstance was created by PII being strewn about and then unfortunately somebody taking an action unwittingly that comp- that that made that data public and and they didn't mean to like and you got to kind of both try to stop them from doing stuff that's going to make the data public but you also have to reduce the impact when that data is public let's make sure that there's less there that that actually is personal information that we're going to end up having to notify about let's like make sure like so to me the vast majority of it is that so let's stop it at that level as much as possible and then we can get to the outlier cases that final 5% again i'm making up 5% and we'll always treat like the crown jewels data a little different so uh, uh, of certain things gotcha no that makes complete sense and uh yeah it's a very low risk it would have to be an extremely rare situation um like those that i mentioned so really you're just focusing on protecting what you have control over protecting yeah and people are trying their best like that's the thing and all this this is it, it truly is an evolving space that new stuff is coming seemingly daily and some stuff is vaporware and and garbage and some stuff is check the box and they they set out in the right direction and now it's checking the box and some stuff is like amazing and it's real hard to sort out what's what here what's actually making moving the needle and making a difference so i want to talk to you about the chicago bar scene do you typically go out and and if you do uh what are some of your favorite bars so i used to more i would say between the pandemic on one hand like that got into it and then the other weird one is like, so I'm like a, a, a decent sized wine guy and I love wine quite a bit. Really? Yeah. And, and beer to a lesser degree and some mixed drinks here and there. But I somehow, I hit an age where like one glass of Pinot and I'm literally going to feel it the next day. Like I'm literally making a trade off against, so I'm not going to sleep as well. Like my sleep is going to be a little uneven. And I'm going to feel it. I'm going to be aware of it in my body. And the whole next day, I'm going to have this kind of nervous energy around like like one or two glasses of wine. Like my body's going to be a little off. Plus it's the sleep. So I'm really like right now, I, like in the pandemic, it kind of intensified this because like you remember in the beginning, we weren't going out at all. So if I just was going to be alone in my, uh, like in my house with my wife and we were just going to have a glass of wine, I was going to have to be prepared to deal with that the, the next day. For like in the in it would be like thirty six hours after for like a glass or two of wine, uh, and I'd be like, eh, I don't know, like I don't know if I'm willing to do that. Now I live in the suburbs, so like for me, Evanston is probably the place that that I kind of like the most in terms of like it's good. It's Chicago is a bit much and a bit crazy, and it's impossible to park. And it's like even if you live like I live like. 15 miles from downtown, but at most normal times, it would take like an hour to get to downtown, which is nuts, but that's just Chicago. So like I go to Evanston and like just wine bars and uh, and stuff like that in Evanston because it's like a cool, it's like a Northwestern University and it's got this cool ecosystem around it. And I highly recommend anybody on the North Shore, like that's kind of what they're probably gravitating towards. Nice, man. Well, Adi, I just heard last call here. You got time for one more? Yeah, hit me. If you opened a cybersecurity theme bar, what would the name be and what would your signature drink be called? Oh, man. This is, uh, this is, so I could work backwards from signature drink because I would, it would be, uh, because I do have a favorite signature drink and I, this would have to be the signature drink, but it would be called Dill or No Dill. Ah, I like that. Yeah, that there is a drink called that that I like. And either I would like copy it completely or I would just make a a, a new version of that. But Dill or No Dill is the drink and it does have dill in it. Uh, I don't have the exact recipe, but there's a bar in London that serves it, that that's how I got onto it. Nice. Um, Burner's Tavern is the name of the bar in London. It's uh, really cool. If you ever are in London and can go to Burner's Tavern and order Dill or No Dill, I highly recommend it. And the, the, the bar is cool too. And every mixed drink on their menu, by the way, is like mind blowingly good. Like Burner's Tavern is like the best mixed drinks I've ever had in my life. Every single one of them, it's like all killer, no filler. Um, the name of it, 
uh, security thing bar. Uh, um, all right, maybe what I do is make it make the 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 words something that you could abbreviate as PII, and that it could be like nonsense words, but. But essentially, the words themselves were just filling in the blanks for the phrase PII, and just everyone talked about going to PII. Let's hit up PII. There you go, man. I'd be there for sure. Maybe I just call it PII and just let people, like, what, what does it mean? It means whatever you want it to mean, brother. Yeah, it's a conversation starter. It's a conversation starter. So I think PII, that, that's, 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 I'd settle on that. Now, because it's called PII, do you still card at the door? You gotta. You got to still card at the door, but you don't be, you don't keep a record of it. You just look and then it gets thrown away. It's just in our minds. It's a regulatory requirement. We don't hold on to it. We don't hold on to your PII, but we check it. We make sure you have your PII. I love it, man. Hey, before you jet out, what's the most direct way for our listeners to reach out to you online? Uh, the easiest place to find me online is canopyco.io is, is Canopy's data breach response and, and privacy audit is our privacy page, but you can find me there. Uh, I'm also like a d.elliot at canopyco.io if somebody wants to shoot me an email. So, and Elliot with two L's and two T's, by the way, people uh, commonly short me a T. But canopyco.io is the company and that is by far the easiest place to find me. Okay, cool. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you stopping by. Absolutely. Take care, be safe. Barco patrons. If you like this episode and would like to support the podcast, rate us on Apple Podcasts and visit our Patreon site, patreon.com slash barcode podcast. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, check out the barcode podcast.com slash sponsor. Cheers. Unfortunately, it's time to shut the bar down for this episode. Thanks for stopping in. See you next time. We'll save you a seat. Be sure to check us out at thebarcodepodcast.com.